never been called an unusual person. I guess it is kind of an unusual situation because I am knee deep in the medicine. In fact, just yesterday, I got called into the office of my bosses. Uh, I work for a university, and they told me that I'm spending too much time with the patient, talking too much to the patient, and I need to do what I'm paid to do, which is cut people open, uh, which of course upsets me. And we'll talk a little bit more. I'm going to talk more tomorrow about the medical industry and about what's wrong with science. We'll get a little bit more sciencey tomorrow. Uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about on the nature versus nurture of obesity and how to escape. Though that sounds boring. So let's call it can, okay? That's going to be my talk, can. Because I see thousands of people with weight problems that come to see me. And obviously I talk too long for my bosses with them. And the one thing I hear over and over and over again is I can't. And what your parents tell you? Can't never could, right? It, but it's so true. And I will give talks to doctors like this. And they'll be sitting in the audience and I will provide science like I will give you tomorrow. And you can't refute the science. You know, maybe on social media and stuff, people have, you know, the bartender who's on Facebook could say, oh, your science is wrong, fine. But a real scientist can't do that. And so they'll say, okay, Dr. Davis, I agree with you. I can't argue with the science, but, and this is what I hear all the time, but no one's going to do it. I mean, I could tell, I've had, I gave a talk to endocrinologists. They said, yeah, yeah, you're right, but I'm not going to tell anybody to eat like this because they're not going to do it. And why are they not going to do it? Because the doctor doesn't know what to tell them to help them change, and because they've grown up like this all their life. I mean, why do you think people like Atkins diets and things like that? Because our entrees are the meat. So you're telling them, okay, skip the sides, just eat the entree. Well, okay, that's fine, they'll do that. But if you tell them, okay, skip the entree, we're just going to eat sides, they get very confused and there's a problem. And, and you got to understand there's a lot more to this problem than what you think. And so that's what I want to go into in this talk today. And I want to start off with just a simple story about the Hoyts. Now the Hoyts, I, I, I love to find examples in life of people that got beyond the I can't and got to the I could, okay? And I think they're a perfect example because he was born with cerebral palsy, but always wanted to be an athlete. And one day asked his father if his father would do a marathon with him. And this kind of escalated and they said, well, we could do a marathon, could we do something else? Then they did an Ironman. You guys know what an Ironman is. 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, 26 mile run, all in the same day. I've done it and it is brutal. So can you imagine a guy taking his, um, his son with cerebral palsy through this process? You know, you see heroes like that <sighs> overcoming unbelievable odds and my patients feel so disconnected to that. Like, that's something I could never do. But when I look at a patient, if I see my patient in the before picture, I could picture them as the after picture. And what I tell them is there's a different you out there, a totally different you, does marathons. They never got off the bench to, you know, can't even go to the kitchen because they're overweight and can't breathe and things like that. But there's another you out there that's completely different and they can't fathom this idea, but then they realize it. And whether it's by surgery or by diet, this is my patient Francis, if Frances doesn't look happy, that's because she really wanted surgery. Uh, and I told her, well, wait, Frances, she was about 80 pounds heavier. And I was like, let's try a little diet stuff first. You're eating nothing but hamburgers. Let's, you know, switch to a more plant-based diet. And she did it, and she kept losing weight and kept losing weight. And then she does, you know, she doesn't weigh enough for surgery anymore, so she's mad at me. But she, uh, <laughs> she's uh, healthy and, and doing fantastic. And I've got these families that make these changes, and it's unbelievable to see how different their life can be. This is Marcus. Next week, I'm going to be in Miami with Marcus. This is his one-year anniversary from surgery. He was 450 pounds. He had had other surgeries before uh, for weight loss, and he just could never lose the weight. And I said to him, I said, Marcus, I'll help you lose the weight with surgery. The surgery is just going to be a tool, though. If you do what you always done, you get what you always got. The surgery is a tool to allow you to make lifestyle changes, but it is the lifestyle changes, whether you're getting surgery or not, that are going to make the difference. And so he said, how can I make those lifestyle changes? And I will share with you some of the secrets we did. But one thing I talked to him about was that do something different every day. Get out of your comfort zone. If you do what you always done, you get what you always got. And he really just 
embodied this and started training. And so next week, we're doing a triathlon together in Miami, the Escape to Miami Triathlon. He's lost 250 pounds, which is a lot in a year. Um, he goes biking and running every day, uh, and he started this little hashtag, do something new every day, and every day he tries to push himself a little bit harder, so it's very motivating. I know about this because I did it myself. I was very, I mean, I wasn't overweight like my patients, but this is me at like 30, and I'm starting to get a belly, and uh, my cholesterol level was high, and I was hypertensive. At 35, I failed a life insurance policy test. And I said, there's got to be something wrong. Uh, and, you know, I go to my doctor, and my doctor's like, yeah, look, hey, no problem. We'll put you on uh, metoprolol. We'll put you on a statin. But I know where that leads. It leads to more medications. It leads to procedures. And we've become so comfortable with disease diagnosis. Like I tell someone they've got diabetes, and they look at me like, hmm, okay, kind of expected that. Uh, it's so expected in life. And I started to say, well, maybe I learned something wrong. And I started to learn a right way to eat, but it was hard to motivate me because I never, when I saw people running, I would think, what kind of idiot runs in this heat? It's craziness. Uh, but I started practicing these lifestyle changes we'll talk about that helped me to change my life and then the lives of my uh, family and patients. Um, and so what I want to do, there's so much information out there, right? I, over the course of the next two days, as I talk to you about science and talk to you about what I do with my patients to help them realize the science and make changes, I want to distill that information uh, into wisdom. And one of the pieces of wisdom I want to start with is don't beat yourself up so much. People beat themselves up, and the reason is they think that bad dietary choices are a willpower issue. When I talk to people about what I do, and I say I treat people that are morbidly obese, they think of my patients as fat and lazy. They don't think obesity is a disease. But obesity is clearly a disease. If you look at the definition uh, in, in the dictionary, it fits a disease by every category and every standpoint. There's a genetic component, there's an environmental factor, and there's an effect on life because of it. And so it's definitely a disease. And yet you go through the internet and you see things like obesity is not a disease. You see fat shaming all over the place. Um, you know, I saw this online. Uh, if you're fat and unhealthy, you should be ashamed of it. I mean, imagine how my patients feel um, when they see this. I, I couldn't believe this. Uh, I saw this and I was bothered that that guy looks like me when I was younger. But uh, uh, it says, uh, dear obese PhD applicants, if you didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, you won't have the willpower to do a dissertation. Can you believe this guy put that out there? And, uh, you know, first of all, it's not the carbs. We'll get to that. Uh, but second of all, just the idea that, that it, it's as simple as willpower is ridiculous that my patients somehow lack willpower. My patients have been dieting way more and struggle way harder than your average person. And so there's a lot of shaming with body types and it doesn't take into account physiology and it doesn't take account of genetics. My patients, for the most part, are obese from birth. Their whole family's overweight. They go to fat camps at like 10 years old. They're in fat camps. They diet their entire lives. They starve themselves. They try all kinds of different things to lose weight. And you got to, <laughs> I think this cartoon is true. If shame motivated weight loss, I would be out of a job uh, because my patients are shame like crazy and yet it doesn't seem to work because shame is not the answer. It's especially not the answer because we've got the wrong way of looking at, at this disease process. And there was an article in Lancet and they came up with this conclusion. We need to change the way we think and talk about obesity and use language reflective of the fact that being morbidly obese is a chronic disease like addictions to drug and alcohol. Patients can overcome it, but it shouldn't be expected to be quote unquote cured. And fewer individuals uh, ever truly recover from obesity. Rather, they suffer from obesity in remission. Uh, they are biologically very different from individuals of the same age, sex, body weight. There will be a patient who is extremely overweight. They've got friends that are extremely underweight, and yet they're eating the same things. They're going out to eat at the same places, and that friend probably thinks of the overweight friend, oh, my, they just need to eat like me, but they're not eating healthy. You know, I hear doctors tell me, oh, they just need to eat like us. They go to the doctor's lounge, you know, and eat bacon and eggs and you know, cakes. Th there's some interesting things. When I say obesity is a disease. I could prove that by showing that there's a very strong genetic component to it. And there's been some excellent studies looking at the genes. And you've got to ask yourself, is it nature or is it nurture? Are we overweight because of how we were raised? Or are we overweight because of our genes? Well, a big part of it is genes. If you look at some adoption studies they did, they took um, kids that were adopted 
And they looked at their weight and the weight of the family they went into and how that affected them. There was a very strong correlation between weight and biological parents. So if they found an adopted kid and they went back and found who their parents were, their biological parents, there's a very strong correlation. If the kid's obese, the parents are probably obese. But there wasn't a very strong correlation with the, with the adopted parents. So if you are adopted as a child into a family that's really healthy and skinny, doesn't mean that you're going to be healthy and skinny. And quite, in fact, quite the opposite. You might still be obese if your parents were obese. Weight is one of the most inherited genes we have on par with height. Now, they did these really interesting studies where they took twins that were separated at birth and raised in different environments. They looked at both twins reared together, twins reared apart. They looked at fraternal twins. They looked at, um, at uh, identical twins. And they looked at the genetic influences. And the influence was substantial. That even if you're an identical twin and one of you grows up in a family that's full of skinny people and one grows in a family that's full of overweight people, you're both going to be overweight if your genes are, the, if your biological parents were overweight. And you could see it real clearly when you look at it, you know, monozygotic, identical twins, reared apart or share in the same environment, look the same. But then when you look at, you know, dizygotic twins, meaning fraternal twins, there's a big difference. They're different people, they have different genetics. And we've actually, uh, scientists have actually been able to tell specific genes, we're still learning, but there are specific genes where if you have that gene, you're very strongly correlated with getting obesity. So what do these genes code for? Well, a lot of it has to do with how we approach hunger. How, you know, there are some people that are hungrier than other people. There are some people that don't get satisfaction from food the way other people do, and a lot of that is genetically encoded. The brain is very complex, and feeding behavior is very complex because our genes are very old, all right? You go back many, many, many years ago, having a gene that made you hungry, having a gene that gave you a slow metabolism, meant you would eat a lot when there was food around and you would survive the winter. The problem is we don't have problems during winter. You know, McDonald's is open 24-7 whether there's winter or not. And so you look at these different pathways and you'll see something very interesting. They did functional MRI studies of the brain, and they looked at people that were not overweight, and they looked at people that were overweight. Now, what they did is they were looking at dopamine receptors in the brain, and in a part of the brain that's associated with satisfaction and desire, and what they found is that the control group had a healthy amount of dopamine. The obese group did not. And what that means is it's harder for them to get stimulated, harder for them to feel satisfied. And if you look at a normal person's brain, an obese person's brain, and compare it to an alcoholic or a drug addict, they look almost exactly the same. They're lacking these dopamine receptors that are required. And, and, and so a lot of my patients tell me it's like a monkey on their back. They're constantly hungry, or if they eat, they just don't get satisfied. They don't get that feeling of fullness. Hunger is not nearly as simple as we think it is. We always, if hunger and obesity is all about choice and willpower, then it should all be centered in the brain up here at the very top, at the cerebrum. But it's not. A lot of it is uh, motivated and driven by parts of the brain that control heart, your heart beating or breathing, you know, very basic parts of human nature. And part of it is controlled, or a lot of it's controlled by hormones that are in the body, by nerve inputs and stretch receptors. There's a lot that goes into the simple desire that, oh, there's a cake, I want to eat it. It's a lot more complex than, than what you think. And part of the way to show that this is a disease is to simply look at the effects if I give someone a drug that affects these dopamine receptors or other receptors, serotonin receptors, things like that. So there's a drug, Qsimia, and you could see that um, that on the top line, that's uh, um, a uh, placebo group. It's always interesting to me that placebo does get some result, right? They gave them a sugar pill and they actually lost weight. Uh, but then the more medication you get them, the more weight they lose. Something's got to be going on. They're not doing anything else with these people but give them a pill. We could do that with the norepi receptors. We could do it with the serotonin receptors. There's a drug out there called Belvic, and you could see the same thing. Or there's a, you know, I guess they, I don't, I always wonder how scientists come up with these ideas, but uh, I guess they must have been looking at people smoking pot and thought these guys like to eat when they smoke pot. So uh, what if we go to the THC receptor and let's block the marijuana receptor and let's see what happens? Well, this drug did really good. If you look at this line, so they got the placebo at the blue, the green is the drug called Ramonabon, and look at that difference. Now, look at that yellow line. You know what happened at the yellow line? Uh, after 60 weeks, 
they started giving some people placebo. They didn't tell them they were getting placebo. And that weight came right back up. All right, there's something physiologic going on. That's not a willpower thing right there. There is something physiologic. Now, the problem with Ramanaman is while it does take away your desire to eat, it also takes away your desire to live. Uh, and some people were trying to kill themselves, so the drug will not be released to the public. Uh, the, the complexity of weight is, is so fascinating to me. Um, have you guys heard of transfusions? Okay, you're going to love this. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's the idea that, that, that we're getting now that you could take bacteria from one person and give it to another, mainly from the colon, uh, and it could change their physiology. Now, this came out because there's a bacteria that grows in the colon that has become antibiotic resistant, and that's called C. diff. And they found that that bacteria, if there's no other bacteria to compete with it, will flourish in the colon. So they thought, what if we put good bacteria in? And it turns out if you put good bacteria in, the C. diff can't live. Great. So you get good bacteria from someone and you take it. So this lady was a skinny lady. She had C. diff colitis. She needed a transfusion. So they got the substance from her daughter-in-law. Uh, and her daughter, they make it into pills and you swallow it. Uh, her daughter-in-law was obese. Six months later, the skinny lady was obese. Now that's an N of one study. We don't know that much about that yet, but it's a pretty fascinating concept because we know there are more microbiome, mi more microbacteria in our bowels and there are cells in our body and they're doing something. And we're learning more and more about this as time goes on. And so for those of you that are skinny, maybe you can sell stuff later. Uh, it might be a business opportunity in the future. I mean, other things we do for weight loss, I do gastric bypass surgery. I mean, this is a big, big, big procedure. I cut the stomach. I make a small little stomach. Now, people think that uh, we get such high success rates because people can't eat as much, but it seems to be much more complex than that. Not only can I not eat as much, but because we're bypassing the stomach, there's a drop in a hormone called ghrelin, which controls hunger. And there's also a change in the microbacteria. So we actually are changing that same bacteria. Now, the interesting thing, when you look at weight loss surgery, there's different surgeries. There's surgeries that, where they just put a band around the stomach. So that's just blocking how much you can eat. And it's effective. It's more effective than all diets, pretty much. Gastric bypass, where we're actually affecting hormones and microbacteria, is much more effective. But look at this. Great loss of weight at one year, but what happens over time? Start regaining weight. You see this in everything. Now, of course, with weight loss surgery, because of the dramatic nature of it, it has better long-term success rates than a diet, but you see this in everything that's out there. And why is that? Well, it goes back to this idea, to this gene, we call it the thrifty gene, that our bodies are made to survive, to hold on to the, the, the fat the body thinks is actually protective. It's going to protect us against a famine. And so there, there's several ways that the body does this. Number one, as you start gaining fat, fat secretes a hormone called leptin. Leptin goes to the brain and tells your brain, okay, we got enough fat on the body. But if people keep putting leptin into their body because they're getting fatter and fatter, the leptin stops working on the brain. However, if you start losing weight, and that leptin level all of a sudden drops, the brain says, whoa, wait a second, leptin's dropping, we need to get some food in here, because it's, uh, it's time to hold on to stuff. Either we need to get food in, or we need to slow metabolism. I don't know if you guys saw in the New York Times recently, um, they were talking about diets, and they were talking about how you, know, you diet, you lose weight, and then you gain more weight afterwards, and they were looking specifically, the diet was actually done on The Biggest Loser. Now, I hate this TV show. I cannot stand The Biggest Loser. They sit there yelling at, at people that are overweight. They humiliate them by going on scales, which for an overweight person is their biggest fear, is the scale. They make them do these crazy diets, and these people lose a dramatic amount of weight, which is great for TV, but as soon as the cameras are off, the weight comes back. And no one really talks about it, but until you've walked a mile on these people's shoes, you don't understand what they're experiencing. And they did this study on these, on these people from The Biggest Loser and found that their metabolism dropped tremendously with these crazy diets that they did and so that the weight was going to come back. Now, I've made a very strong case that obesity is, is a disease, and I've made a very strong case that there's a genetic component to it, but we're getting bigger. We're getting bitter, bigger very quickly. 66% of the country is overweight, 30% is obese, 33% and, 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 and growing. And our genes aren't changing, so there's got to be something else going on, right? 
So maybe we are partly to blame for the situation. Um, it, 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 might, it can't all be the genetics. And uh, what basically happens is you take this thrifty gene and you add something to it. You add the idea that there's a gene that's supposed to make us eat a lot and hold on to that way, and then we just get really high calorie, calorie dense, fat food, and we're inactive. And so we have, it with diseases, a two-hit hypothesis. So for melanoma, you have to have a gene that predisposes you to melanoma, you go in the sun and it activates the gene. Here we have a gene that predisposes you to obesity. We've got food that is made to fit your addiction that is very high calorie density, and we're getting lazier and lazier. So, you know, we don't, uh, cavemen may have had this gene and they may not have been overweight because cavemen didn't eat that much. They couldn't eat that much. There wasn't a grocery store to go and do it. And they were running around like crazy, but we're kind of like, eh, let's just do it tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, you know, I love this picture here. <laughs> People taking the escalator to the 24-hour fitness is just a classic example of what we deal with. But more fundamentally, look at the way we eat. Like, and, you know, you guys know that I'm going to go crazy about protein, right, tomorrow. But it, what the thing that's crazy to me is, like, like, we have some kind of protein deficiency in this country. It's the most ridiculous concept. Look at the way we eat, okay? If you look at the different things, so this is from the NHANES data. If it's to the left, that's the percentage of people that are eating enough of it. To the right is the percentage of people not eating enough of it. So look at beans and peas. I mean, we're hardly getting nearly enough beans and peas. When you look at legumes, they're one of the best indicators of a society's ability to live long term. So long-lived societies eat lots of beans. Long-lived societies eat a lot of vegetables. But look at our vegetable intake. It's absolutely horrible. Now, look at our empty calories and junk food. Yeah, we don't lack in that. And we don't lack when it comes to refined grains. So we love refined grains. We hate whole grains. Don't give us whole grains, but take off all the fiber and good stuff and give us the junk grains, you know? We don't do well with fruit because everybody's like, oh my gosh, fruit. We'll get on that tomorrow. Uh, but we do obviously eat enough meat, poultry, and eggs, uh, plenty. And I would even argue that their level of what we should eat is wrong. And so if you look at the diet over the past 30 to 40 years, there, there's a lot of reasons we're getting overweight, but the biggest reason is we're eating more. We're eating more of everything except fruits and vegetables, but we're eating more and more. So look at the calories. If you look at it, um, you know, people have been told to eat less meat and less fat for many years, but we never ate. I hate it when people said, oh, low-fat diet failed. We never went on a low-fat diet. We eat 67% more fat than we ever did. We eat more sugar, we eat 41% more meat, we eat 25% more calories, we eat out more than we've ever eaten out before. And so this is a big part of the problem. When you look at our diet, 7% of it's from fruits and vegetables, and I don't even think it's 7%, because part of that 7% includes potatoes for french fries. Uh, and so, you know, really our refined and processed food and, and dairy and animal food takes up the vast majority of what we eat, which has made us the most overweight and sickest country in the world. So there's a lot of things that lead in to being overweight. There's genetics, and there's all these things feeding into it. I mean, there's things, there's peer pressure. There were some great studies showing that zip codes have common weights, or the peer groups you hang out with tend to have common weights. And so the, all these things are affecting whether or not you're going to suffer from this horrible disease of obesity. But I'm here to tell you that just because you have a gene that predisposes you to obesity does not mean that you have to be obese, does not mean that you need to take medications, and does not mean that I need to cut you open. There are ways out of it. You're not destined by your genes. We can beat genes. So what do I do with my patients? Like that one lady I told, showed you, to get her to change her lifestyle that she's had since she was a kid so that she can eat a diet and do an exercise program so she doesn't need my knife. Well, we do a, a few things. One of them is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'll go into a little details about what that is, but it's journaling, goal setting, cognizance, and aversion, uh, attraction. I hate crash dieting. That's where you get the really big drop in metabolism. When I look with patients, I used to do this all the time. I used to put people on these um, high protein shake diets and the diet, the weight would fall off. And I would be very proud of this amazing weight loss that they would have at six weeks and amazingly disappointed at six months when it was all back and then some. Uh, and so I'm very anti-crash dieting. I want people to lose weight slowly, 
steadily so that each time they come in, a little bit more off. I'm very big, of course, on plant-based diet. I'll talk more about that tomorrow, and a little bit about it today. Moderate exercise, and we'll talk about the quantifiable self. So, cliche as it is, success is a journey. It's not a destination. I have to go over this over and over with my patients. Everybody wants that quick fix. It's done tomorrow, and what I often see is people lose the weight and then be like, okay, I've arrived. Uh, what am I going to do now? I, I use this book a lot. If you want a book that really goes into cognitive behavioral therapy, this is uh, uh, Judith Beck actually invented the field of cognitive behavioral therapy. The book's called The Beck Diet Solution. It has nothing to do with diet whatsoever, but rather how to change your diet in order to be effective. So I really like this book. Uh, and part of it goes with goal setting. Now, I'm really, really, really big about goal setting. I think one of the problems in Western society is we have so little goals. We wake up we go do our job, we come home. Without goals, life is just, you're like this, you know, piece of plastic floating in the ocean uh, with nowhere to drive you. Goals are really important. Set daily, this is from Nastia Lucan, set daily, monthly, and long-term goals. So I, I want my patients to have a long-term big picture, but you don't want too big a picture and have that be your only goal because you lose sight of it. If you have a goal, uh, you know, I, because I like marathons, I might have a goal to run the Boston Marathon, but that's way in advance. And it's so far in advance, it almost doesn't seem applicable to today. So I might not want to go and run today, but if I have a goal to get a certain amount of miles this week or get a certain time in my run this week, that all leads to this bigger goal that I have. So that's really important. Don't ever be afraid to dream too big. You've got to think outside the box. Like I told you, my patients just can't even imagine you know, Marcus that I'm doing that triathlon with, if I told him last year that a year from now we're going to be doing a triathlon together, he would have never believed that. But in fact, it can happen. Uh, nothing is, is impossible. Uh, if you believe in yourself, you can achieve it. That's mostly true. Be careful. There's some goals I don't like. Girls be like, I finally hit my goal weight. You know, um, I, don't like, I don't like weight necessarily as a goal. Uh, and you, you don't want too extreme. I mean, you want... Uh, tangible things. And so when I talk about goals with people, I, I want them to be what we call smart goal setting. Very specific goals. I want things that are specific, that are measurable, that are reliable, attainable. Look, I want to be an Olympic swimmer. It's not going to be attained, but I could still be a swimmer, so I could be in swim competitions. Maybe I'm not going to be an Olympic swimmer. But I don't like it when people set like completely unrealistic goals because you'll see that one goal failed sets off a domino effect where they're like, okay, it's all done. So you need to have a lot of little goals. These goals should be relevant. They should be time bound so that you give yourself a time period as to when you're going to reach these goals. Um, I have this kind of theory and it's been talked about a bit in the, in the internet. For those of you that know me, you probably know that I, I tend towards a bit to the extremes. <laughs> I don't like moderation very much. Uh, I, I, moderation is just a strange word to me. What is moderation? What's moderate? And how moderate do you want to be about your health? But there's this idea. It's really difficult to do things with a 99% effort. But it's really easy to do things with 100%. And let me explain. You know, it's really hard. The, I hate diets where there's a cheat day. Okay, this is the worst. So you're, you're in your week and you're eating this food and you're like, I hate this oatmeal, but I'm going to have eggs and bacon on Saturday. And every day I hate this oatmeal, but Saturday eggs and bacon and eggs and bacon gets vaulted to this unbelievable ideal in your brain because you're constantly thinking about eggs and friggin bacon. So that when you finally eat the eggs and bacon, you oh, yes, eggs and bacon, eggs and bacon, this is the greatest thing ever. I love my cheat day. What is happening during that time? What is happening is you're reinforcing an idea that eggs and bacon are what your body wants, but you're doing something differently. It will never work if someone doesn't eat a cheeseburger because I told them not to eat a cheeseburger. They need to change their view on cheeseburger, which we'll get to. Now, 100% is a breeze because if you basically put a line in the sand and you say, I don't eat eggs and bacon, it's not on the menu. I don't eat it. It's not there. It, I am no longer an eggs and bacon person. I will never be an eggs and bacon person. Eggs and bacon line in the sand. Or whatever your vice is. For me, it was pizza. Line in the sand. I'm not doing pizza. Line in the sand. Now it's easy. I go to a pizza place and I get a, you know, a vegan dish. Uh, it doesn't even like 
affect me anymore, but you have to have to make these changes. So I like a line in the sand. The other thing I really like is that you've got to applaud yourself. There, it's great to have role models and things like that, but be your own hero. Notice your improvements. Notice your achievements. Like Marcus, every day will tell me, today I did this. I've never done that before. I've never achieved this. Marcus is his own hero, which is great. Uh, it sounds bad, but it's actually, it's great. Uh, it might sound ego-ish, but it, 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 he is really motivated by himself, and he realizes that he's getting closer and closer towards his goals, and that's what is important. So, so focus on the successes that you do make as you get them, and enjoy those successes. Now, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So we need to have more of a plan than that. And the thing I like about plans is they allow you to take control. We, we act, we, we, everything we do is so almost subconscious. I mean, when you eat, it's almost subconscious. And a lot of people talk and they're watching TV. They're not keeping track. They're not even thinking about their food. If I ask, I always ask patients, what did you eat yesterday? Oh, my God. They cannot remember for the life of them what they ate yesterday because it was a very subconscious movement that they did. So one of the first things that I love to do with patients is to start a food journal. They hate it in the beginning. Everybody hates doing food journals. But there's been studies that show that a food journal by itself, without me telling you what to eat or anything, if I just tell you to journal your food, you will lose weight better than a group that I tell them what to eat, but they don't journal. Journaling is very important because journaling makes you very cognizant. And what I have my patients do is pencil in the night before what they're going to eat the next day. Never, ever, ever make a game time decision about food. If you're sitting around goalless, as most people are, it's lunchtime and you're wondering what's for lunch and someone brings in a pizza, a pizza's for lunch. All right. But if you've got goals and the night before you write down, I'm having a salad, I'm going to the salad bar tomorrow and I'm having a salad. And lunchtime comes around and someone brings in a pizza. You're like, I got goals. I've got it in my book. I don't want to go and write down that I had pizza next to where I put salad. This is a very effective way of doing what's called cognitive behavioral therapy or rewiring the brain. And so I'm very big on, on patients keeping track of what they're eating, when they're eating. I like them to use hunger scales too. Because we have to assess how hungry are you really. There's hunger and then there's hunger. There's physiologic hunger. It seems to come more from the belly and you feel it and the grumbling. And then there's emotional eating and stress eating. And so I like the patients to be very thorough about are you hungry before you eat? Are you hungry when you leave the table? We, you, you hear about, and we, you've all those done, right? You've left the table and you've been like, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to vomit. And you feel terrible, right? I've got to lie down. You think about Thanksgiving, everybody on their couch looking like hell. Why do we do that to ourselves? And then we forget about it by the next Thanksgiving. You're ready for another huge, disgusting meal. And so... It, the more you can remember how bad that is, the less you want it. Whereas the more you remember how great you feel after a meal, the, the more you want to stop it. In, in Okinawa, they actually have a, uh, a saying called hara hibachi bu. It's, it's actually in their culture to try to push away from the plate when you're 80% full. This is in their mindset. Eat till you're 80% full. We're eat till you clean the plate. Uh, and... And so you can really change that by becoming more cognizant of how hungry you are. How many meals do you need to eat a day? You know, it doesn't really seem to matter. There, there, there was a study called the National Weight Control Registry. So what they did is they got people that were actually successful, because 98% of diets fail. But what about those 2%? What are they doing different that allows them to be successful? And what they found in the National Weight Control Registry is that everybody ate breakfast. Breakfast was a big thing. Fruits and vegetables were a big thing. Moderate exercise was a big thing. We'll get to those. But eating breakfast was a big thing. So I kind of stressed my patient eat breakfast. But what I usually do is I start off with four meals, three meals and a snack with my patients. And then we look at hunger scales. We look at people are getting hungry. And we will add food. I, to, to, to tell you the truth, I don't care how many apples a person eats. I don't care how many carrots they eat. You, no, one get, no one is getting fat off broccoli. Uh, and so I don't care about these things. But I want them in power of their food. I don't want their body controlling when they eat. I want them controlling their body. So I want them to have it planned. So if they need to eat five meals a day, fine, just have it planned. And so that's what we try and do is structure that. Um, I do not, do not, do not like calorie counting. I tried it like crazy. Believe me, in my office, I've got a very expensive machine collecting dust right now that people blow in and it tells them their metabolic rate and then I could calculate their calories. This was the biggest exercise in disaster for me because people would come and say, I'm eating the calorie amount that you told me to and I'm gaining weight. And that's because, first of all, the calorie counters are all over the place. So 
you, whether you're using my fitness pal or these different ones, they're calculating calories differently. People underestimate their, their, their calorie, underestimate their calorie intake by about 50%. And so it's just a very, very ineffective tool in my, and the other thing is if you're losing weight, your metabolism will slow. So now if you want to lose more weight, you have to need to eat even less calories. So I don't do that. And the other thing I don't like are things like Weight Watchers where there's point systems. Although I will give Weight Watchers credit because they did change something. You know what that was? They gave fruit and vegetables zero points which is, I give them zero point. I don't care how many fruits you eat. Um, but the problem with that, that is people, they start doing this calculus with food that just doesn't equate, where, oh, I ate 10 points this morning, so I'm going to skip lunch so I could have 10 points tonight for dinner. That, your body just doesn't work in that physiologic manner. And the other thing they do is they start perseverating about food. They're constantly looking, you, you know, the... The diet I try to structure is, should be, eat. people always tell me, boy, you must have amazing willpower. I don't have any willpower. I just love what I eat, and I eat until I'm full. I just ate a huge salad, um, and that's how it needs to be. There shouldn't be any like, oh, my God, I'm starving, or, oh, my God, I need to think about this constantly. It shouldn't be like that. Now, the next thing I really try to get with my patients, and I really try to talk about, is think before you eat. I don't care if you have to say grace or you just sit there and think, where did my food come from? You know, where, what was my food before? Because we are so disconnected from our food. We don't think about it anymore. It wasn't like when Ma and Pa used to make the food that they ate. All right? You know, food's coming from a different place now. And if you think about where it comes from, if you really think about it, your tastes will change. So your, your food may come from here, uh, but a lot of times it comes from here. And this is an illusion because it's all colorful and has this illusion of variety. But when you stop and think that most of the food didn't even exist, didn't even exist 100 years ago, wasn't even there, it makes you start to think, well, what is it? And it's all the same thing, right? It's all derivatives of corn, uh, whether it's a Dorito or a Cheeto or whatever it is. What is a Cheeto? I don't even know. But, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's not real food and that is at issue i mean it's crazy to me that we take garlic pills you know garlic's great you put it on your food you can't eat a strawberry you gotta you know have it like like this and you know it's we love mcdonald's french fries but if you take mcdonald's french fries and you put them in next to just cut up potatoes as fries and you wait two weeks and you look at it isn't it even fungus has the good sense not to eat a mcdonald's fry and when you start thinking fungus won't eat it, but I do, it changes your view of a McDonald's fry. I mean, the, one of the most unbelievably awful foods you could possibly eat is deli meat. And people go to Subway sandwiches because they think that's, oh, Subway sandwiches are great. So the World Health Organization, the American Institute of Cancer Research, looked at thousands of papers. And I know people that were on this board, and they're the smartest people I know. And they concluded that deli meat Processed meat is a class one carcinogen. Do you know what else is a class one carcinogen? Cigarettes, asbestos, plutonium, and arsenic. <laughs> plutonium. Plutonium or ham. And the other thing is it, it's packaged so it's packaged so like like neat and like it, look at this like a, this square little piece that's going to fit perfectly on your sandwich but it, and it doesn't give you a moment to sit and think what it really is i mean if it was packaged like this people would think differently right you would wait, wait a second do i really want that ham sandwich and so these are the visuals i want going through my patients minds now i used to love double cheeseburgers in fact as irony would have it, I trained at University of Michigan, and on the second floor of the University of Michigan, there is a Wendy's, where we got Wendy's dollars, so I ate free Wendy's for five years of my training, uh, where I ate cheeseburgers day in, day out. Um, now, when I look at cheeseburgers, I, I could vomit. Like, I can't even, I don't have a concept where I would want this anymore. When I look at that, I see this. I picture some kid in the back, you know, just like frying it up. He doesn't care about that food, right? He's just throwing it around. Now, I'm not getting get into meditation much, although I think meditation is extremely important because we all have a voice inside our brain, and that voice is sending us negative messages. If you are quiet, you will hear that voice talking to you all the time. They're talking to you right now about, oh, I agree with Dr. Davis. I don't agree with that. Da, da, da. You know, that voice is talking all the time. Talk, 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 talk. Meditation is a great way to get control of it. So I decided I was going to meditate. This was before I was a healthy eater. I was just deciding that I needed to get hold of my um, health, and so meditation was where I was going to start. So I signed up for a meditation retreat, and I got there, 
and it was vegan. And I was like, whoa, because I'm from Texas. I mean, there was meat. There wasn't a meal without, I didn't, I had no concept of a meal without meat, especially because I didn't eat vegetables. So what's left? Um, and so I, I fought with it at first, and then I said, okay, I, I'm going to do it. And um, so I started eating this food, and it is unreal. I mean, it is so, so good. And the food just makes me feel incredible. And in fact, it's, it actually ruined my meditation experience because I was sitting there meditating, thinking, you know, like, oh, what's for lunch? Oh. <laughs> and um, and I, went, I went to the chef who looked like this. I found this video. I was like, he looked just like this guy, like a little French guy. And I was like, I, he, I came in, and I still have this, this was like 12 years ago, and I still have this very clear image of him, and I went into his little kitchen, and it was like partly outside, and birds are chirping, and he's whistling, and he's cutting up all this beautiful, there's produce everywhere, and I said, hey, I just got to tell you, your, your food's, a, what is it about your food that just makes me feel so good? And he turned to me, and he's like, this is the worst French accent ever. Uh, imagine he's Italian, he's like, it's because I make it with love. Uh, <laughs> And that stuck with me, though. That really got, I was like, he makes it with, he's preparing, he's making it with, he's whistling a tune. It's in this beautiful setting. He's making it with love. And that stuck with me. And I came back and told my girlfriend, now wife, and we always think that way. Is that food made with love? Because I just want food that's made with love. That's, that's what I want. And I look at food differently now. I look at it as life and death. Which is prettier? Which do I want in my body? I used to think that my food was coming, like if you asked me, I never really thought about where my hamburger came from, but if you asked me, I was like, oh, well, Bessie here had a good life, chewing on grass, enjoying herself until one day she passed away and my burger came. Um, but, you know, the more visuals you get as to where your food actually comes from, if I stop and think about where my food comes from, it, it really changes the way I think. You know, as Paul McCartney said, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be vegetarian, and it's fairly true because it's not a pretty sight. Um, you know, lines like this, as dramatic as they are, play with a person's psyche. Every hamburger begins with an animal begging for his or her life. You are what you eat, and did I want to be this guy? And the answer is no, I wanted to be this guy. <laughs> and so it really made a change in the way I did things. Now, interestingly, what I'm giving you sounds anecdotal and kind of touchy-feely and is it really true and it's not the usual science you're probably expecting to hear from me or that you will hear tomorrow but they actually did a great study there's a program called the i diet and the i diet it's a website and they've got a program and there is programming like i'm talking about as part and they also do a lot of plant-based diets or a lot of fruits and vegetables now the interesting thing they do with the i diet going back to the beginning of the talk where i was showing you those mri studies they took a group of people, they showed them, they put, they put them in the MRI machine, they showed them junk food, high calorie junk food, brain lit up, like, oh yeah, I want that. Showed them a salad, meh, brain said, meh, you know, maybe a little blip, but not much. Went through the iDiet program, got behavioral training, saw how great they felt on the diet, lots of videos and things like that, lots of programming like we're going through right now. Six months later, they repeated the MRI study, showed them the high calorie junk food, brain said, meh. Showed them the big beautiful salad, brain said, yes. So you can rewire your brain. Tastes can change. Seen it in patients multiple times, seen it in myself. So I, I take it even further with my patients. I have them practice aversion therapy. Have you guys heard of aversion therapy? They do it with cigarettes. They do it with smoking. But what I have them do is make a collage that they're going to put up that they're going to see every single day. And I start at the center picture. I want them to take a picture of themselves that they don't like. This is for them. They don't have to show it to me. And then I want them to surround it by pictures of the foods that they typically are attracted to. Like they would typically want those donuts or they typically want that pizza. But when there's a picture of themselves that they don't like or that represents their feelings as to why they are pursuing these goals, and this is up every day where they see it, it has an effect on the way they look at food. It changes their relationship. They start to see what they get when their friend and their comfort food is a cheeseburger. Whereas I also have them put up a picture I tell them to put it on the other side of the bathroom mirror, where it's a picture of what their goals, what, what picture speaks to you, what picture is your goal, and then surround that with these beautiful colored fruits, vegetables, and beans that I want you eating. And this has a very powerful effect. So 
your brain is starting to rewire and say, I want this because it makes me feel good, because it leads me towards my goals, because no one died in the making of it. So I want their brains to be programmed and thinking about, I tell them, just imagine me on your shoulder every time uh, and speaking in your ear, and my patients get that, and they tell me they, I haunt their dreams. Um, be careful, I tell them about restaurants because, you know, hello, my name is Roberto and I'll be your enabler this evening. Uh, restaurants are terrible in that regard. Um, I try to get my patients to, and I make it a practice myself, that if we're going to dinner, because we like to go out socially with friends from time to time, I will look at the menu online, I will pick out what I'm going to have before I get there, so that, again, I'm in control, I've made the plan, and uh, it's ready to go. Uh, I'm very big on whole food, plant-based diet. Some reason, people seem to think that that means we're okay with sugar. Uh, and I don't know where that comes from because the two are unrelated. An apple and a donut are different. And the difference has to do with the fact that the sugar, interestingly, is not making you fat. Because your body has a hard time actually turning sugar or carbs into fat. I don't know if you guys know that. It's very difficult for the body to turn carbs to fat. But the sugar creates blood sugar fluxes. And these blood sugar fluxes, when your blood sugar is low, you're hungry. And what are you hungry for? More sugar. And so we kind of get trapped in this... Uh, I like this experiment with the uh, humans. They appear to be intelligent, but display an irresistible attraction to sugar. Um, but, you know, the truth about carbs is carbs are not making us fat. It, it, it's so wrong. It, in order for a carb to be turned to fat, it's called de novo lipogenesis, and your body doesn't want to do it and will fight. It wants to store the carbs as glycogen or use it as energy. And so this guy, um, Mark Hobb, is a professor of nutrition in Kansas State, and he went on the Twinkie diet. You guys hear about his Twinkie diet? He ate nothing but those junk foods that are there, the Twinkies and all that kind of stuff. Nothing but junk food, but he kept his calorie count low. Uh, he did all the metabolic testing and, and calculated it very accurately and weighed everything, and he lost 30 pounds. Um, and so it's not the carbs, it was just the general pattern of eating and his cholesterol level dropped. This, this is not to say go on a Twinkie diet, okay? That's not my advice. It's not good for your long-term health. Uh, there's people out there with this, especially in the exercise world, with this, if it fits your macros. Like if you have a certain amount of protein and a certain amount of fat, a certain amount of carbs, it doesn't matter what you eat. I mean, lunacy. Uh, I was at an American Society of Bariatric Medicine meeting. I'll talk about it tomorrow. But look at the diet they're recommending their patients. Eggs and bacon olive, uh, steak, blue cheese. Um, and, and people don't even think about food anymore as food. They think about it as their component parts. You know, All they see are like calories or fat. Or, is that a protein or is it a carb? It's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Meanwhile, in the blue zones where people have the longest, healthiest life, no one's counting carbs. They're not walking around Okinawa thinking, well, I wonder how much fat is in that yam that's over there. Uh, and, their, and their weight is so much lower than ours, than ours and drops over a lifetime, whereas ours goes up over a lifetime. And when you look at their diet, the vast majority of what they eat is actually yams. The vast majority. They're a carb-eating society. So is every single blue zone. Eats predominantly carbohydrates. So we'll talk about this tomorrow. Where do you get your protein? Uh, nothing <laughs> irritates me more than that question, which is why I wrote the book. But let's get real simple on what to eat. Uh, what to eat? Easy. Eat real food. Not too much, mostly plants, as Michael Pollock said. It's very simple. It's very easy. It does, in fact, happen that, you know, they did that, that study on the biggest losers, and they found that when they lost weight, their metabolism slows, and then they gain back weight. If you lose weight slowly with a highly nutritious, high-fiber diet that stretches your stomach receptors, that sends vagal nerve uh, um, signals back to your brain, you actually get full and your metabolism doesn't slow. So I've been checking metabolism on patients that are losing weight through the plant-based diet and their metabolism isn't slowing like it was when I put people on the high-protein shake diet and they lost lots of weight and lots of muscle uh, at the same time. Um, it's important to get food as whole as possible. And I think this is a great example. If you look at a whole wheat, when you eat it, there's a blood sugar response, but it's completely different than fine wheat flour, which is a huge blood sugar response. So which one are you going to be hungrier on two hours later? It's going to be the fine wheat one because the blood sugar is going to surge. Insulin is going to surge because of that. Blood sugar is going to drop. You're going to be hungry again sooner. Fiber is crucial, absolutely crucial to success into feeling full. We eat so little fiber 
10 to 15 grams is the average American. My patients, they come in, everyone's eating high protein. Everyone is eating high protein because they think that's what it is. And no one's eating fiber. And they're missing out on this idea that you could get a huge portion that fills you up without getting nearly as amount of calories. And you look at oils. Oils are a killer. So what we're going out now, I tell you I don't like counting calories, but I like the idea of calorie density. And what the calorie density says is if, I, I use 600, but the calorie density you, is looking at the amount of calories per weight of food. And the idea is if it's 600 or less, you could eat as much as you want. All right? It doesn't matter. And the reason is technically you can't eat as much as you want. There is a limit. Like if you ate... Two th if your metabolic rate is 1,800 and you ate 2,000 calories worth of broccoli, you will gain weight. But you can't possibly eat 2,000 calories worth of broccoli. It just isn't going to happen. And that's the key behind this calorie density. Now look at oils over there. Oils are a killer. They are extremely, extremely calorie dense. And it's one thing that I've found over and over in my patients when they come to me and they're, I'm eating healthy, I'm eating healthy. And as I look through their diet, and especially when you're eating out, when you're eating out, even when they give you the calorie amounts, they're not giving you the calorie amount of the oil that's on the grill that they're using to cook with. Because that's getting into the food. Oil is extremely calorie dense. And you got to look at it. Let's, okay, let's talk about ridiculousness here. All right, Pam cooking spray. All right, so it says Pam cooking spray, all natural. So if you look at the ingredients in there of their all natural stuff, it starts with canola oil. So first of all, there is not canola oil bubbling up from the ground, right? It is not natural. It's processed to get that way. Um, I also have never seen propellant naturally in its natural, I don't, you know, there's propellant. Um, okay, so there are zero calories in Pam cooking spray and there's zero grams of fat. But it's an oil. So how is there zero calories and zero grams of fat? Can anybody tell me? Okay, so what's the serving size? The servings, you can't see the serving size up there? It says one-third of a second of a spray. <laughs> one-third of a second of a spray. So I don't, I don't know how you measure one-third of a second. Uh, you'd have to, I could just imagine like the one person's got to stop. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but that's not what people do, right? They take that pan, they're like, oh, this is zero calories. <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting overweight. <laughs> And people, the funny thing is that people are so scared, like people come into me and I'm looking at their diet log and it's just like, you know, cheeseburger and, and bacon and, and it's just, un, I'm like looking, I'm like, oh my God, this diet's horrible. I said, well, let's try something different. Like for lunch, let's have a potato. Potato? Well, isn't that bad for you? I'm like, oh yeah, the potato's bad for you. And meanwhile, the potato is the most satiating food. When they did a study where they had people eat all these different foods, you could see the potato was off the chart up there as the most satiating food you can eat. There is nothing better than a potato to control hunger. So I have my patients mash up a potato and put black beans and salsa and avocado, and that's a great lunch, and they're full for the rest of the day. So I actually teach some cooking classes to my patients, and what I basically tell them is keep it simple. I mean, for breakfast, Berries and some muesli cereal is fantastic. Or oatmeal and berries, it's pretty, it's delicious. Salad with soups for lunch, always get some beans in there. Beans are actually have a really good effect at controlling blood sugars over a lot of time. We have vegetable chilies for dinner that are really great, or I make whole grain pastas. I say I make, my wife would kill me if she heard me say that. Um, and. Uh, the food is delicious. It, it tastes fantastic. This is my favorite meal. This is a restaurant in Houston, which is called the Macrobiotic Platter, and it's just rice and beans and steamed vegetables, uh, and I eat that thing in like one second, and I am full forever afterwards. But not just, you're, you're full, and I probably don't follow that Okinawa rule. I mean, I'm, I'm full. I'm not 80% full, uh, because it was so good. but I don't feel bad. I don't feel weak and tired. I don't have that two o'clock after lunch, you know, oh my God, I feel, I feel unreal energy for a 46 year old guy uh, I feel like I could you know climb mountains um, and the way I look at food is differently I can't believe what I used to eat it was so ugly and now it's just so beautiful and so delicious and these are the visuals I really try to stress to my patients because it's the visuals that are so important I always tell them you know if you're not that hungry if you're not hungry enough to eat an apple you're not that damn hungry uh, so eat an apple first and then make a decision you got a craving eat an apple and then reassess I tell you what, you could have the ice cream if you eat an apple and then you want the ice cream. But you eat the apple and you're like, yep, yeah, you know, I'm all right. 
And people think this diet's extreme. I, when people tell me a vegan diet is extreme, I'm just like, you know, I can, this is extreme. I mean, what they're doing, tearing up your body, absolutely destroying it with every bite, and what we eat is extreme. Real quick, a few words on exercise. You know, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? I have to have these discussions with people because people are constantly, I can't, I don't have time, I can't, I can't, I can't. I hear the word I can't over and over again. So I can't, you know, I, I say to people, this is my workout algorithm. Should I work out today? Yes, and then work out. No, yes, you should, go and work out. Uh, and, but... We have to have a correct concept of working out because it doesn't, they, they don't have to be crazy like me. You, I, like the, I like exercise because I could set tangible goals like we talked about before and I could see results, but you don't have to go crazy with it. To be healthy, you don't have to go crazy. What is the best exercise to lose weight? You know what the best exercise to lose weight is? It's actually the exercise that you will do. <laughs> All right? So if you will swim, then that is the best exercise. If you do Zumba, then that is the best exercise. If you go for a walk, then that is the best exercise. You just have to move. And the funny thing about exercise is that it's probably not even the exercise that's important. It's the NEAT. Have you guys heard of the NEAT? Non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is a fancy doctor word for saying movement. It is the movement you do in a day. So they've done great studies where they have desk workers, like people that just sit at a desk all day, and then they go and you know, work out like crazy, do CrossFit or whatever. They're not getting the same benefit as someone who's actually getting 10,000 steps a day. So I actually love, 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 love Fitbits and step counters and things like that. I absolutely require my patients to use it, I'm constantly asking them how many steps they get a day. I like it for several reasons. It's biofeedback, right? It tells you how many steps you're getting. You've got an easy Set goal. What do we say about goals? It should be smart, tangible, achievable, measurable. You could do that with the step counters. I want them getting eight to 10,000 steps. I don't care how you get it. Park further away. Take the stairs. Um, after a while, your body starts to understand what you need to do in order to get those, th those, um, those numbers. And they don't start at 10,000. They start at 5,000 and then you know, go to 6,000, go to 7,000. So we have goals along the way to get to that 10,000 steps. There's a, a movement called the quantifiable self, which is keeping track of everything, which you think I wouldn't like because I don't like that Weight Watchers keep track of. But I like the idea of being cognizant of what you're doing so that you're no longer subconscious. And I talk about that a lot with my patients, being cognizant about the changes you're making and monitoring to see how you're doing with your goals. Uh, that data is very, very empowering. So one uh, real quick video left here that I just wanna show you, which kind of, I think, is a great way of talking to yourself um, about how to make changes and motivate yourself. There's a guy talking to himself here. Okay, wait done. Just take a breather. Gotta keep going. What? It's not the deal. I think we can go on. Since when do you start thinking? Whatever. So who exactly are you trying to impress? Because you're sure not impressing me. Save your breath. We're gonna need it. Save your breath. You can't see yourself. You look disgusting. This isn't the time to start pushing. We've got to stop. You're the one who's got to stop. Me? Me? Are we in this together or what? I don't know, are we? I'm the one who got to see you. You're the one holding me back. I'm holding you back. I'm just trying to look out for us. Not like you. You just want to ditch me. Or maybe I should get rid of you. Stop running. No. Yes. 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 No. Stop. You can't go. Please. I'm done with you. Leave your old self behind. Reincarnate now. I love that. Leave your old self behind. Reincarnate now. That is what I tell my patients and the patients that are successful. I see it in their eyes. I see them realize there's a different person out there and they could be that person. So sometimes in life, the questions are complicated, but the answers are simple. They did this huge study called the EPIC study, and they found that five servings of fruit and vegetables saves you four years of healthy life. Not smoking gives you five years. Moderate exercise gives you three more years. If you do all three of those, you get 10 healthy years added to your life. 10 healthy years. 
Take away alcohol and that gives you 14 years. How many people do that in this country? 3%. 3%. It's simple. It's easy. Eat your vegetables. Change your life. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Do we have time? Are we doing questions? Oh, okay, sure. You guys got questions? I mean, I'll get to more sciencey, substantive stuff tomorrow, but we could ask those now, too. With the fruits and vegetables, um, which B12 would you recommend, if any? Um, yeah, B12. God, why is B12 is like such an issue? With it? Like, it's amazing to me. Like, someone online the other day was like, do you take B12? I was like, yes. They're like, then your diet is completely discounted, <laughs> which is so funny to me because I see meat eaters come and see me, and they're taking every kind of supplement you could know to mankind. Um, B12 is not made by the human body, not made by animals, comes from bacteria. In the days where we had food grown in organic soil that we would pick up and eat without cleaning, we got B12, but no one does that anymore. Everything's cleaned and cut and skinned and all that kind of stuff, and so we could get low B12. Funny enough, there was, in the Epic Data study, they looked at vegans that were not very, they were healthy, but they weren't supplementing, they weren't getting enough calcium, they weren't getting enough B12. And they're, because you, if you don't get enough B12, your homocysteine level could go high, and that could be an increased risk of heart disease. So they said, well, vegans are putting themselves at risk for heart disease. Now, when they looked at it, did the vegans have heart disease? No, they had less heart disease than the meat eaters, even though they weren't eating B12. That's not to say don't take B12. Take B12. I, I don't really care. It, it, I, I take 5,000 sublingual, I think I use Nature's Way or Nature's Made. I don't even know what I use. Uh, 5, 000, I just pick it up at the store, 5,000 sublingual once a week. It costs nothing. Once a week, 5,000. Um, probably you can get it if you were crazy organic and just eating dirt. Uh, I actually have a friend who does that. Doesn't eat the dirt, but she's very organic and very, uh, and her B12's fine and she never supplements anything. Um, but that's the only supplement I take. That's it, B12, nothing else. Yes? Um, you talked about transfusion. That was very interesting. And Transfusion. <laughs> oh, oh I said it wrong. <laughs> Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but what about um, uh, Dr. Clapper talks about uh, the bacteria that grow that send messages to the brain and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, there's been um, this look at what we call butyrate producing microbacteria. They produce something called butyrate, which uh, is actually very protective to the lining of the colon and also decreases inflammation. Uh, and may have an effect on obesity. We don't, we don't have the bugs down completely yet from the obesity factor, but it may. Um, they did an interesting study that was published in Nature. and took a group of people, had a lead-in diet, then they went vegan, and they looked at their microbacteria, and it was very butyrate-producing. Now, there's this thought that whatever microbacteria you got as a kid is the microbacteria you have all your life. But they then took these people with the butyrate microbacteria and everything, and... Um, they fed them meat for five days, and their microbiome completely changed to a non-butyrate producing bacteria. This was in Nature, one of the top magazine, uh, top journals. And so there's a dramatic effect that our food has on our microbiome. And how that affects disease, we're still learning, but it does. There's no question. I was just yes. wondering, um if you have someone that's really elderly or someone very obese and they're trying to eat better and they also want to exercise, but they, you know, when you're very obese or you're older and you have lots of, you know, aches and pains, what do you do? Do you start both or do you just get up and walk 10 steps? What, what, what yeah. do you think about that? Yes, absolutely. We set goals about it, but with my patients, we set goals. You're going to do 10 minutes three times a day and we do shake weights with upper body or we do the... Um, What's that stick called that makes that my, our physical therapist uses it? I can't remember the name of it. It's, anyway, so you get the idea. The thing. And uh, it, it's this, um, th this idea of like stepping outside your comfort zone. So if your comfort zone is sitting, doing nothing, then we say, okay, you're, what do you do during your, while you're sitting? Well, I watch TV. Okay, during commercials, you're going to do this. And you're going to do this much this week. And then next week, you're going to add to it. It's this idea of long-term goals 
with short-term goals to get you to those long-term goals, easily measurable, replicable um, goals that, that we have them set and we have them go through. And, and so it, for, it's actually sometimes some of the most dramatic changes I see are people that are completely bedbound just doing a little bit seems to be more uh, incredible than someone who's moving a lot, doing moving even more. It's, it's going from nothing to actually moving your body could be a really big deal. And we look at different ways of moving the body. Sometimes people need to do water aerobics or get in the pool and walk back and forth. Uh, some people could do upper arm type stuff. You just have to, we, you gotta treat each patient individually. But yeah, getting moving even, it, it could be very effective. Much, you wouldn't think that little bit of movement would be effective, but it really is. Yes. Hi. Um, oh, one, one real quick thing. It's <coughs> effective if the diet's changing too, but you cannot out-exercise bad diet. You cannot out-exercise bad I diet. I read a book a few years ago about leptin and insulin resistance, and it seems like if you don't have the leptin working, then you can't lose weight. So could you explain how you could get, and ghrelin and leptin, those hormones, how you get that activated in this cycle? And yeah. does that prevent you from losing weight? No, um, sheesh, tough question. I mean, I could get a Nobel Prize with that answer if I, if I got it completely correct. Um, we don't understand leptin completely. There's definitely leptin has this feedback mechanism. Your fat produces leptin. The leptin's supposed to go to your hypothalamus. It's supposed to drop your drive to eat. You start losing weight. The leptin levels go down. Your brain says, eat more. So there's a, there's a, a balance there. Although we find in obese people, they are not sensitive to the leptin. And we think it's because they're exposed to so much leptin that the brain starts to downregulate, but we're not sure. And, and so, for example, if you're morbidly obese and I give you leptin, it does nothing. So we can't use leptin as a drug. It just doesn't work that way. But we have noticed that if people lose weight and their leptin levels drop, they do start getting hungrier. We think that's a leptin thing. But you could get over that by, well, okay, you're hungry. Here's a nice big gigantic salad with balsamic vinegar. You fill yourself up, but you're not getting calories. Um, and, and so that's how we battle that with what's called volumetrics or low calorie density or high fiber, however you want to talk about it. Uh, that seems to do a really good job of, of controlling that hunger. Same thing with ghrelin. I mean, if you're eat, if ghrelin does control hunger. There's ways to combat it with um, medications. Uh, but nothing seems to work better than whole foods and plants. It's really simple. We could get into the itsy bitsy science of it. We get into the fact that I dropped the ghrelin level when I cut the stomach and, and divert the food stream, but you could do the same thing just by eating fruits and vegetables. The ghrelin's supposed to make you hungry, so fill yourself up, but fill yourself up with fruits and vegetables. Does that make sense? It does, but if you're eating low-calorie density food, it doesn't matter. It, it's okay to be hungry, just so long as what you're eating is going to control that hunger. That's what we try to get to. I, don't, I, I try to teach my patients to not fear hunger so much. We do our food log. We find out when you're hungry. If you're hungry at a certain time, we're going to eat, but we're going to eat low-calorie density foods so that you satisfy that itch as best you can. Now, look. I do still believe, there are patients that are so genetically predisposed to obesity that I do utilize things like fentermine and Qsimi and Belvic, these medications that play on these same hormones, uh, and they do work. Um, they're, they're a tool. They don't, if I just take a person and I put them on fentermine, they will lose weight no matter what. Um, but we're talking about five to ten pounds. Now, if I put them on fentermine and a high carb, low fat, whole food, uh, plant-based diet, they'll lose 50 pounds. So, you know, it's, it's a combination of things. To me, the medicines and the surgery are a tool to help people adopt a healthy lifestyle, but it's the healthy lifestyle that matters. You may have just answered my question, but I'll, I'll ask it in a slightly different way. Sure. You're talking about people here that go on like a fast losing diets and they get to their desired weight and then they, in the, in the next six months, they gain it all back twice. Right. Is there something you can do for people who have lost all that weight to keep them from gaining the weight back, um, uh, other than eating the low calorie density of food? No. Every, every other diet fails long term. So this has been looked at multiple times. Even, 
even the low calorie density diet can fail. I, I, well, or p people don't stick with it. There was a great study called the A to Z trial where they looked at all these different diets. Over a year, all the diets had gained back their weight. People gained back, and that's what that New York Times article about The Biggest Loser was about. But when you look at the way people are eating, they're crash dieting. Now, when you crash diet, that leptin level will drop like crazy, and that's an emergency alarm to your brain. Leptin drops, you get hungry, your metabolism slows. Ways to combat that are, first of all, not let your metabolism slow. You know, in men, not just men, women too, but especially men, building muscle to keep your metabolism going, movement to keep your metabolism going, filling yourself up with low calorie foods. You're, there's no way to get fat eating the kind of foods that I'm talking about. You're not gonna eat, no matter how hungry you get, no matter how, how big your salad is, if there's not oil on it, you're not gonna get enough calories where you're, you're, you're going to get overweight. So it's proper eating and exercise. It, it sounds simplistic, but it's the answer. I've been doing this for 15 years, and there's no trick up my sleeve uh, except for surgery. But you don't want surgery. I mean, the people that get surgery are people that need surgery. I was just going to ask you about the surgery. How safe is the surgery? And I mean, nowadays in the right hands, we have a program around the country now called Center of Excellence, so you have to put all your data in, they have to make sure you have low complication rates. I mean, the risk of dying. Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan's like my, do you guys know Joe Rogan? He's got a podcast and he's like a MMA, uh, he's a comedian, he did the fear factor, and he's my Twitter troll. Uh, he tweeted the other day to me that surgery is unsafe and one in 50 people die. This is the thing about America now, you could say, like Trump, I mean, you could say whatever you want. It doesn't have to even have a semblance of fact. One in 50 people die. There's no way the surgery would be done if one in 50 people, I wouldn't do something where one in 50 people die. I'd be in court all day. Uh, and so uh, the, probably the death rate is like 0.2%. Uh, and it's a, actually extremely health, uh, extremely um, safe. It's, it's pr it probably works too well and is too safe because now the medical establishment is looking at it being the answer to diabetes and obesity. And it's not the answer. It's an extreme way of treating a problem, but it's not the answer. The answer is let's not get diabetes and obesity. But no, it's very safe and it works well. But lap No, lap band's terrible. Uh, gastric bypass sleeve gastrectomy. Those are the, the two main ones. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, I just had a, a question. It seems like a lot of people um, indulge in like um, mindless eating, bored eating, they're watching TV, they're just like, they're not even really thinking about what they're eating. And from what I have talked to these people about, it's mainly like, they say they like crunchy foods. I mean, like they're ingrained to have the high calorie, the high salt, chips, whatever. And I'm like carrots and they're like, no, it's just not the same. They're like popcorn. I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't know. So what would you recommend? Because obviously like carrots and stuff, they're not going to sit there and like keep grazing on it. But, um, you know, so uh, it kind of goes back. And I didn't mention this. The other thing we do with our patients is have if then cards. And it, this is part of the cognitive behavioral therapy and it's in Beck's book. And the if then card says, if you think critically about your eating habits, where do you get tripped up? And when patients say, well, I get tripped up because when I'm watching TV, I want something crunchy. So I say, okay, well, how are we going to handle that? What is a solution that works with you? I can't tell you what my solution necessarily is. What's your solution going to be to that problem? If it's a problem, that means that you want a solution. So let's talk about solutions. So let's say we come up with a solution. Instead of potato chips, which are salty and have a crunch, we're going to do pickles. Okay, we're going to do pickles. So I want you to write on your card, if I get hungry for chips, I am going to instead eat pickles. They write it down, physically write it down. This programs the brain so that when that situation comes up, they have that if-then card, they've, they're in control now. They're not controlled by the TV set and this drive for chips. They're now controlled by the card that says they're doing this and it's written in their journal that this is what they're going to eat. And that's how you get habits to change. You know, we have things like... Uh, I, at night, I like to open up the refrigerator. Uh, one of my patients is like, I, I, at night, I have to open up the refrigerator. I uh, open up the refrigerator. Okay, so what we're going to do is in the refrigerator, we're going to have cut up carrots. We're going to have a bowl of fruit. We're going to have, you know, whatever it is that's there so that when you open it up, you grab something, that's what's there. 
and we're going to put in the journal, you're allowed to open up the refrigerator at such and such time and grab what's ever there. Just got to make sure that whatever there is healthy and they've got that on there. If then, habits change. But it's that you have to plan for that habit to change. Yes. Um, I have a friend that we're really concerned about. She had the surgery where you put the belt on the stomach. Yeah, yeah that's not a good surgery. And what happens is that when she eats, mm -hmm. which we, we believe, we know she's overeating, she's regurgitating all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm trying to find out, I just want to know what are the repercussions for, from bringing that acid up in your throat? Oh, it's not good. No, it's, it's not, not good. You get cancer, you get all kinds of stuff, you get pneumonia, asthma. She needs the band taken out. Oh, okay. Yeah, you get the band. We, or you can get it loosened. If she has an adjustable one, you can okay. loosen it. So what I usually do when people come in like that, I maximally loosen it, and I okay. tell them that they need to get full with fiber. Because okay. the other thing that happens is bariatric surgeons. Like, I'll go to a bariatric surgery convention. We have one every week called Obesity Week, uh, every year called Obesity Week. And we will sit there for hours upon hours talking about the research with weight loss surgery, and yet never once mention food. Food's not discussed at the obesity conference. So it's not discussed. So obesity surgeons tell their patients, you need to eat protein, 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 protein first. And so they're stuffing their mouths with bacon and eggs and all that kind of stuff. Because that's what their, their doctor tells them, eat bacon. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. And then they get bad results. And yeah, and, and it, it, I'm not shocked by their bad results, but their doctor's like, okay, that's a bad result. Let's go to another surgery. Uh, and so my thought is, well, before we go to another surgery, let's stop eating that and start eating this and try changing these um, behavioral habits. I have a question. Uh, yes. You framed your book around protein. And huh? so when people do ask you the inevitable question, where do you get your protein? What's your answer? Can I give it tomorrow? So, um, so eating vegetables, um, you're saying you can eat all you want, but isn't there, um, when it comes to fruit, because of the, even though it's natural sugar, there's probably should be a limit on how much. Absolutely, categorically not. No, eat whatever you want, as much fruit as you want. You could eat 100 want. bananas if you can eat 100 But like bananas. watermelon. I don't care how much watermelon. Really? It is there's physically impossible it. for the human body. It's not impossible, <laughs> but nearly impossible. So de novo lipogenesis is what the process is where the body will take a carbohydrate and convert it to fat because the body's primary fuel is going to be carbohydrates. So what the body wants to do before anything is to take that carbohydrate and store it as glycogen. And it will store, depending on uh, each individual, varies, but it could, it could store up to 1,000 to 1,200 grams of carbohydrates. On top of that, if you, if you were to eat 1,200 grams of carbohydrates, which you're not going to, but if you did, it still, you would have to eat even more carbohydrates after that for it to start doing de novo lipogenesis. And De novo lipogenesis is an energy intensive, so your body would have to actually burn calories. There is never, not once, not one single study anywhere in the scientific literature ever in the history of science shown a single paper that has ever, ever, ever said that fruit causes fat. It doesn't happen. It will never happen. You could eat as much fruit as you want ever, forever, ever. And anybody who tells you you can't eat fat is a complete idiot. And you could tell them I said that. Oh, sorry. Fruit. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't eat fat. Fruit. Yeah. Fruit, 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 fruit. Um, I am off salt for a few years mm -hmm. on the Celtic salt, Himalayan salt, sea salt. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that added to the salads? Or? Dangerous if you have no other source of iodine in your diet. You have to get iodine. Okay. If you're getting uh, Lugol's, that, that has plenty of iodine in it. Okay. So you're supplementing iodine. Otherwise, it's fine. I, you know, salt is not, I, you know, it depends on who you are and your genetics and do you have essential hypertension. I mean, if you're truly hypertensive, salt's not a good thing. But it, salt is not the whole story. Just like anything's not the whole story. Calcium is not the whole story with osteoporosis. There's lots of other electrolytes. The problem is not the salt all by itself. It's the imbalance of salt to magnesium and potassium and all that kind of stuff. So if you're on a varied plant-based diet, then you can tolerate salt very well. But if you're not, then you can't. Uh, if you're eating junk food, same with carbs if you're diabetic or insulin resistant. Insulin resistance is not caused by carbohydrates. It's actually caused by fat getting into muscle cells, making your muscle cells insulin resistant. And if you're eating a high fat diet 
and it, fat is getting in your muscle cells and you're insulin resistant and you eat carbs, it will make your blood sugar go up, even if it's fruit. So now fruit all of a sudden isn't good for you. Any, well, it's still good for you, but, but if you're eating fat, it's not, not being processed properly. Uh, and so the story the same thing is if you're eating a healthy diet, it's okay. If you're not eating a healthy diet, it could be a problem. Okay, one more question. Yes. Uh, I'm, I am confused about something. I'm not a proponent of the keto diet, but I have seen many people, they say they use the keto diet and they've lost weight and kept it off and they're really happy. They've lost large amounts of weight and they're eating 90% fat, 5% carbs, 5% protein. And uh, so, is there a placebo effect because they're so happy that it doesn't no, matter? No, they, uh, y you legitimately lose weight on it, but always because your calorie counts decrease. So what happens is, well, a few things happen. When you go into ketosis, you get rid of all your glycogen stores. So I just told you there's a thousand whatever grams of glycogen stored in your body. Glycogen is stored with water. So when you burn up glycogen, you burn up water. So a lot of the weight that's lost in the beginning is water weight. Also. When you don't have glycogen and no more carbs for fuel, which is your primary fuel, your body makes these ketones for fuel. Ketones are induced diuresis, so you lose even more water because of that. Um, now, the ketones make you not as hungry, so people tend to drop their calorie intake, so they don't eat as much. So every study that's been done that has shown beneficial weight loss with the keto diet has shown that they, um, the calorie count decreases. It doesn't matter, just like that Twinkie diet I showed you, it doesn't matter what you're eating. If you're eating a low calorie diet uh, or lower calorie diet, you're gonna lose weight. And that's how they lose weight. Sad thing is they seem to always put it back on. Um, the A to Z diet was the, the best controlled trial uh, where everybody put back on the weight and the Ornish diet was in there, although people weren't eating an Ornish diet at all. Um, but they were eating an Atkins diet. They actually were fairly compliant with the Atkins diet. And they lost a lot of weight at six months and they put it all back by a year. Part of the reason for that is that eventually that joy goes away. Uh, and they start craving, craving, craving carbs, which usually leads to bad carbs, not good carb consumption. I, I, I feel that the paleo diet is a little bit better. Uh, it, it is still Atkins, but it's Atkins improved because there's no dairy. They don't have any, they're very anti-junk food. They're eating lots of vegetables and fruits. Uh, so it's a little bit of better Atkins. They were eating pork rinds and junk like that, which was terrible. Now, the other thing, the best long-term, there's a couple of good long-term study, low-carb studies that have shown benefits, but there's never been like, uh, and I'll show you tomorrow, I and mean, there's studies that show that a vegan diet reverses heart disease, reverses cancer, uh, increases blood flow. I mean, all this stuff. There's never been anything like that with these low-carb diets. The only thing they look at is weight and lab values. And there's a great sweeping under the rug. So one of the best studies ever with low-carb, they wanted to show that a low-carb, if you ate a low-carb diet, your metabolism would do better. And it barely did better, like a real small amount better. So they, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is the greatest article. Now, when I read journals, I never read the conclusions anymore because the authors, that's the author's bias is in that conclusion. You go and read the actual study methods and results. They're C-reactive proteins through the roof, so they were extremely inflamed. And I see this a lot in low-carb people, and I saw it a lot when I used to do low-carb on people, is you get really bad inflammation the cortisol in their urine was really high, which means that their body's under a stress response because this is a starvation stress response. And there, is a, there, there was a, several good studies that show that you're actually decreasing flow to the heart. So while your LDL cholesterol and some people, if they're fat adapted, could get better, their heart has decreased flow to it. Um, and people say, well, it's great for diabetes. And it's not great for diabetes. It lowers your blood sugar because you're not eating any sugar, but you're eating fat. So when they did studies on people on this diet, there's still fat in their muscle cells. So if you give them sugar, it goes right through the roof again. So they actually have diabetes. Whereas if you take someone and put them on a low fat, whole food diet, the fat goes out of their cells. You give them sugar, it doesn't go up. So you're actually curing diabetes. So it doesn't cure diabetes. It puts it on the back burner. All right, thank you guys. I'll see you tomorrow, I guess.